Well, good morning, everybody. Anyway, it's morning here right now in Spokane, Washington. This is Mountain Preacher and Jesus, and man, I'm stoked to talk about this uh, podcast. It's going to be dealing with pride and rebellion and how pride and rebellion actually greatly affect our relationship with God, greatly affects our mental capacity, greatly affects our uh, relationship with others. So I'm going to be getting into that just in a few minutes, but um, just so you know, this amazing looking mountain behind me is in northeast Washington, right on the Washington Canadian border up on the Selkirk Mountains. It was beautiful driving through there just a few weeks ago. So that's where that mountain is. This is Mountain Preacher in Jesus. I love the mountains. I love Jesus. Been saved and born again since uh, 1987 when I was 19 years old. Um, before I get into this uh, particular title today and, and issue and talking about pride and rebellion and how it affects us, uh, I just want to encourage you to um, email me, vanbraydean at gmail.com. If you have questions, if you have prayer requests, um, if you would like to, as you're going through this book and there's some really maybe some tough spots for you, I just want to let you know I'm open to doing a Zoom call. Um, with, if you don't live in a Spokane area, because that's going to be very common. There's going to be people listening to this um, all over the United States and Canada, perhaps the world. And I'm willing to do that Zoom call to help people out. And that's my passion is to see people um, become right in their mind, have a sound mind, follow Jesus. But not only follow Jesus, because a lot of Christians are out there that do follow Jesus and love Jesus and love people, but they really struggle with their mind. They really struggle with depression and anxiety and maybe bipolar disorders, or maybe they still have a lot of trauma in their life. I am here to help you. And how I'm going to help you is I'm going to point you to the creator who is God. He's the one that put us together. He's the one that knit us together. So I just want to encourage you, please um, get this book. It's on Amazon. It's called Freedom to Live Like Jesus. You can just type that in Amazon. should come right up. The cover looks just like that, red, white, and blue. And uh, I'm excited. Um, I wrote this. This has been years and years and years, decades of helping people, helping myself in a sense of me walking through a lot of this stuff in my especially pride and rebellion holy smokes i've had a lot of it and still deal with it sometimes and i'm just here to as a pastor and again it doesn't matter if i'm a pastor or not but as a pastor to confess that man i still deal with this thing called pride and rebellion and my mind can be greatly affected um sometimes i can get depressed a little bit or if i start getting anxious obviously i've worked on this with god for years and years and years so i've kind of learn how to really, uh, when I sense things coming in my life, I've learned to really go to the word of God and just pray and ask God, I recognize those things in my life now. It didn't, it wasn't like that at the beginning. So I just want to encourage you. I'm also asking you to please share this. Um, if you um, struggle with mental illness or, you know, pet pride, or if you struggle with things like condemnation and shame and guilt that you're a Christian and you just don't know how to get over that stuff. If you're not a Christian, you're just honest with yourself and you say, you know what, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I'm interested in learning about having a healthy mind and a sound mind and, and how God created us and, and knit us together in our mother's, mother's womb. So I'm asking you, please share this podcast with friends, family members, um, I go, I'm going to go through this book, um, lesson upon lesson is, I don't know how many podcasts there are going to be, but there's going to be dozens of them to go through this book. Again, my passion is to help people get set free. So when I always say this in our church and I say it in groups, I say it all around when you can go to bed at night and have peace and joy in your life, and you can get up in the morning with peace and joy in your life. And you can walk throughout the day with peace and joy in your life with a sound mind and, and, and be able to think straightly. That's a victory in our culture. Our culture is so messed up. Now, we all walk through storms of life. We all go through grief. We all go through some heavy duty things. Some of you right now are dealing with heavy trauma, heavy abuse in your life. You don't know how to, maybe you've been paying a therapist for years or whatever to, to help you through those things. Well, I'm not against therapy, that's for sure. But what I want to point you in the direction I want to point you is that there's only one way to get fully healed. 
and have a sound mind and be mentally strong and fit. And that is to go to the one who designed our mind, designed us how to think, designed us how to psychologically process a life and, and just our thought process. God is the one who made us, designed us. He's the one that knows how to heal us. What I've shared so far in the first two chapter is that to get healed, we have to lean on Jesus, or there's some different metaphors in scripture, whether you lean on him, you press in toward him, or you fall on the rock of Jesus Christ. They're all metaphors, meaning that we depend upon God. We depend upon Jesus. We, we recognize that he is the healer. We recognize that he is the one that designed us. So that's what I'm talking about when we press in or lean on Jesus or fall on the rock of Jesus. What we're doing is just admitting that we struggle, that we have issues in our life. And, and I hope that everyone has the ability to say, you know what, I do struggle with things in my life and I want to I want to have a sounder mind. I want to have a clearer mind. I want to be able to think straight. I want to be able to get out of depression and anxiety attacks and get off medication and all those things that I deal with. That the, the world wants to put the medication on us. The world, uh, pharmaceutical companies, man, they're making trillions of dollars off of people who are broken people who um, have some mental illnesses in their life like depression and, and bipolar disorders and, and anxiety attacks and deal with huge amount of traumas from their past. Well, I wrote this book, Freedom to Live Like Jesus. And again, uh, I struggled with a lot of these things in this book. I'm more than happy to share them as we go, and I will. Uh, struggles in my life, things I had to work through and allow God to work in my life. Um, but so many people out there, and I'm talking Christians who truly follow Jesus and non-Christians deal with mental uh, they have a lot of mental struggles in their life. And it's not just about mental illness. It's just not about being mental. But man, uh, the Bible teaches, as far as the New Testament goes, and the, the Old Testament does too, that the Word of God, the Bible, our Bibles, are designed to bring our minds, to change our minds or transform our minds, to be like the mind of Jesus Christ. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was sinless. His mind didn't have any depression. His mind didn't have any uh, anything in it that would cause him to have anxiety or anything like that. But we all struggle with those things, and some very severely, some just very little tiny bit on the surface. But we still struggle with those things because of the how life just throws us curveballs. And there's no such thing as this utopia life that we don't face any issues. We always are going to face issues, whether relational issues or just whatever it is, we're always going to face storms of life. So I'm starting in chapter three right now. I did chapter one and two already. Podcasts are up. Uh, Mountain Preacher and Jesus, you can find it on most podcast platforms. But I'm going to dig in now on the thing that actually takes us away from mental stability and actually um, helps us go down a road and have more mental illness and struggles in our life. And that's called pride and rebellion. Um, I'm not, um, I, I would call myself an expert in this area. <laughs> I, I've dealt with pride and rebellion a lot in my life, especially in my teen years, in my 20s, and even into my 30s. I got saved. I gave my life to God when I was 19. And that was a real experience. Well, I could still see it today. I could still feel it today. It was so real how God changed my life. But when God changed my life and I got saved, when the Holy Spirit moved into my life when I was 19 years old in 1987, he didn't take away. He didn't press the delete button in my life that says, okay, now all the problems you've ever went through and the pride and the sin. And yes, he covered my sin. He forgave me completely of my sin. I've already covered that. So yes, our sin is completely forgiven, but our struggles and our uh, things, the lies, the strongholds in our life, he didn't delete those memories. I still, I still lied. I still dealt with things like pornography and lust, and I still dealt with uh, cheating. I still dealt with um, things in my life that were sinful towards God. Fortunately, he's a gracious God, he's a loving God, and he has patience with us, and he's willing to help us, and that's what life is. A life is a journey to become more like Jesus. Um, I, I realize so many people call the church hypocrites and all that kind of stuff, and yes, every church has hypocrites, and every person in every church is a hypocrite at one time. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you're a hypocrite. I've, we've all been hypocrites, and 
we're not perfect, but we're supposed to mature in the Lord and process our life and face those things in our life that especially pains and hurts. And today we're going to talk about uh, uh, conquering pride and rebellion. And first of all, what is pride and rebellion? And then how do we conquer pride and rebellion? Um, <clears throat> I've already said this, and I, I'm going to continue to say it because it's, it's encouraging, and, and we all need to hear this. Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the Godhead, however you want to say that, I'm not going to get theologically that, man, you don't have to call it the Trinity, it doesn't matter, but Father, Son, Holy Spirit, however the, the Bible teaches a triune being, however you want to define that is fine, but it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and um, he created us in his image. So let's just think about that and practically walk through that just a minute. When God created us in his image, he designed us to have a mind like him, not all powerful and all knowing, I'm just saying, but a mind like him in that we could think and we could process and he's gifted each person differently and he gave each person a personality. In other words, we are people are the apple of God's eye. We are his ultimate creation. Animals can't think like that, and that's not their design. Uh, human beings are, but the problem is that human beings are very evil. I think our culture proves that. For the last even 2,000 years of church culture, we've seen even people in the name of God probably have caused more wars than uh, people not. So, man, people can just be evil. You guys, if you're hearing my voice, you know things that have happened in your life or to friends that just evil things that should not happen to other people, but they do. And how do we deal with those things? So God created us. So if God created us and he knit us together in our mother's womb and he knows everything about us, not only does he know anything about everything about us, he called us to good works. He called me to do things and he called you to do things. He gifted you and gave you talents and interest and desires, and I'm not talking about sinful desires, I'm talking about desires to go and do good things, okay? God created us to do that. So if God created us, why don't we go to him for our healing? The world rejects him, the world system rejects him, and the world, uh, Satan's kingdom, is going to do everything it can do to keep you from going to the maker, the maker of the universe, the designer of our soul, the designer of our brain, the designer of our heart, the designer of our emotions and how we think and process, that is God. That is Jesus Christ. So the first two chapters, I deal with that, how much God loves us, how much he, the, the spiritual gifts he gave us in salvation, how powerful salvation is, what it means to walk and be in Christ Jesus. Um, and and we, we approach life through that uh, pedestal. That's not a pedestal that we look down on people, but it's a platform that we are in Christ Jesus for what he did on the cross. And we are, we live life from that, but so many Christians don't live life from that. Um, knowing who I am in Christ, they live life in defeat. They're always depressed. They're always anxious or they, they're always shameful of their past. And they're always guilty and condemned of their past. But if you know the scripture, what I teach in chapters one and two, we do not have to walk in shame or guilt or condemnation or any of those things because we are in Christ Jesus. Well, unless you understand the scripture and understand who God made us to be, it's a hard, very difficult to walk out of those things. But I teach you and I show you the scripture and encourage you that as Christians, we are in Christ Jesus. And if you're not a Christian, again, please, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to yell and preach at you. I'm actually here to uh, encourage you to ask God questions. God, ask him anything you want. God's not offended in you. He doesn't get offended if you uh, yell at him and scream at him, ask him questions. God wants a relationship with you. That's the that's how he designed us, is to have, be in relationship with him. But we're going to talk about pride, and there's a couple of different stories in the Bible. One is in the Old Testament in the book of um, uh, Daniel. Uh, there was a leader called Nebuchadnezzar. He was a in some senses, a great leader, uh, very prideful, rebellious, rebellious toward God, uh, you know, very self-righteous and uh, was a world leader. He was one of the world leaders at the time. And and there came a point where um, he at times he would recognize God because of Daniel, Daniel and 
uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and some other Jews that were held captive at that time. And he'd look at their life and he'd go, man, there, there definitely is a creator. There's definitely a God. And came to a point in his life where he just rejected the whole thing. And he he said, you know, there, there is no God. There's only I'm God. And he started comparing himself to God. And basically pride and rebellion really crept in even more than it was. And God actually condemned him to madness. In other words, he kind of went out of his right mind. It was like he was demon possessed by a evil spirit or more than one evil spirit. And he actually left his kingdom, his city where he was the king. And he went out into the fields and the trees and the forest. And he was a, basically like a wild animal for seven years and um, he ate the grass. He, you know, slept in the, the by the stumps and the trees, and probably ran and tried to eat, kill things, bathe with his bare hands. I mean, he was a complete animal. He was a madman at that time, and demon possessed. And it wasn't until after seven years that he. There's a point in the book of Daniel where he looks up to heaven, and it was at that point where he was delivered from his madness and. God put him back where he had a sound mind and he recognized God as the creator at that time. But I want you to catch this point. It wasn't until he looked up and, and saw heaven, there was something in his heart that went, man, there, God is up there. The king of kings, the maker of the universe is up there. And I'm paraphrasing it right now, just to give you a, a roundabout story here. And God delivered him. So what does that say for us? That says for us that we got to recognize our pride and our self-righteousness and our, our, our ability or our flesh saying, man, I want to do this. I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. I don't need people and I don't need God to get ahead. Well, what that is, is just pride. God designed us to be in relationship with him, to depend upon him, and he designed us to be in relationship with each other, where we would love each other, serve each other, um, you know, think uh, great thoughts and encourage each other and comfort each other and exhort each other. And the design of God is that his church, his people that serve him, would be in love with each other. And the world would see that and go, man, I want to be a part of that because I see these quote unquote Christians or followers of Jesus. And man, they just love each other. They're not perfect. They still do dumb things and sin sometimes, but man, they love each other. And um, so we're going to talk about that today in uh, chapter three, episode one on uh, Mountain Preacher and Jesus. And then the, the other part of the story I want to talk about is in the New Testament is that um, Jesus and his um, disciples were going across a lake in a boat. They crossed it and landed on shore and it began to walk up in the sandy beaches and the hills there. And there was a man there called a demoniac. Um, I don't know if we've ever been given his name. I'm not sure. Um, and again, I'm just paraphrasing this story, but it's, it's amazing. And this is, I want you to catch this. If you're struggling with evil in your life, if you're struggling with strongholds or depression and you try to you try to break through and maybe you're even on medication and you try to break through and you just maybe you feel you're getting you take one or two or three steps forward and you just get blasted in the forehead with a spiritual two by four. And you just you not only do you take a step backwards, you take about three days worth of steps backwards and you just get depressed and you just say, oh, man, I'm never going to make this. I just I don't know how to do this. Well, let me encourage you. This man, we don't know his name demoniac we're gonna that's gonna be his name it says he had a legion of demons we don't know why the demons were in there we do know that he was a crazy dude just like nebuchadnezzar those seven years crazy he had chains on him and people couldn't control him that's why he lived around the tombs and man he was he cried out day and night and screamed and screeched there was just he was just full of demons he was crazy and no one wanted to go near there because they'd probably kill him and he was just uh, he couldn't be held down by people because he had spiritually, he had, he was full of demons, but check this out. This is such an amazing story. So no matter how difficult you're going through it right now, again, maybe it's past abuse, trauma, 
and you're really dealing, you hate people that hurt you and you're protecting yourself and just all sorts of stuff in your life and depression and maybe bipolar stuff going on where you're up one week and the next two weeks you're so down you can't get out of bed. And I don't say those things flippantly. Those are real things that people deal with every day. And I want to encourage you that when this demoniac saw Jesus Christ from a distance, we don't know how far it was, maybe it was 50 yards, maybe it was 100 yards, he saw something, just like Nebuchadnezzar looked up to heaven, and in that moment, what he was doing is saying, God is the creator. I recognize God as the creator. I've been prideful, and I've been wrong and rebellious against God. This demoniac looked down on the shore of Jesus, and in his mind, he saw something. He saw the king of kings. He saw the man, the God who created him. He saw the creator. He saw the Messiah. He saw, he saw King Jesus, and he was a, oh my gosh, I'm going to go toward him. Now, I want you to think this through. This guy had massive amounts of demons. He was crazy. He was probably the craziest man that ever lived by the amount of demons he had in him. So you don't think he was depressed and had about a million different voices going on all the time in him. I mean, he heard, he heard it all. He probably heard, he never stopped hearing screeches and screams from these demonic forces. Long story short, he saw Jesus and he began to go toward the man who can heal him. And all these demons could not stop him because he was going to go touch the one who was going to heal him. If you're going through something that is painful, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's something that you're trying to cover up from your past, maybe it's sinful things that you did that you never want to admit because you think they're way too bad. I'm telling you, they're not. The cross of Jesus Christ cover those things. You're atoned for those things. You've been forgiven for all your sin. Maybe it's abuses from your past. You've been hurt sexually or physically or spiritually. Maybe it's uh, you grew up in a very religious church that didn't know anything about relationship with Jesus and all they taught was legalism and you better get it straight or you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell, all this kind of stuff. All those things greatly affect who we are. And if you're going through something, I want you to catch this. If you put your eyes on Jesus and say, I'm going to walk toward him, I'm going to lean on him. I'm going to press into him. I'm going to fall on the rock of Jesus Christ. And when I do, yes, painful things are going to happen. He's going to take things out of my life that are very painful, but he's going to give me grace and mercy and rest and peace and joy and love, long suffering and forgiveness and all the attributes of God. He's going to give those things to me. And all I got to do is give him well, the thing that stops us from giving God those things that are painful in our life is pride. Pride says, no, don't depend on God. You can do this. You just keep trying and trying and trying. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, unless he looked up to heaven and recognized God, or this demoniac, unless he saw Jesus and walked toward him, neither one of them would have ever got delivered in their state, and they would have died in that state. I'm telling you, if you put your eyes on Jesus and walk toward him, nothing in the world can hold you back. You could have Satan and all the demons out there, all of them trying to hold you back. And if you walk toward Jesus for freedom, they cannot keep you from that. They only can keep you from that if we buy into their lies and their deception, which we're going to talk about uh, in a couple chapters from now. But these two stories are amazing, and hopefully they encourage you that if you're struggling with something in life, strongholds, and we're going to get into a lot of different strongholds and what they mean and what they are. If you're struggling, put your trust in Jesus. Find another Christian, maybe in your church, if you go to a church, and if you don't go to a church, man, email me, Van Bradeen at gmail.com and what we'll try to help out. But I'm telling you, both of these people, Nebuchadnezzar and the demoniac, they saw God and they walked toward and recognized God as the healer. So if you do that in your mind, you're going to find healing. Go to the Amazon and get my book, Freedom to Live Like Jesus. I walk through all this stuff to help you get free so you could live in mental 
healthy state of mind where your mind is sound and you could make wisdom decisions and walk in life. So my deliverance, um, or excuse me, my pride, uh, was, I had a lot of pride growing up. I learned it, you know, from different people in my life, but it really became a huge thing in my life. And I wrote an analogy here. I want you to listen to this um, on how pride hinders us from our relationship with God and hinders us from relationship with other people. Pride is like a wall we build between ourselves and God, slowly cutting off the light and life he wants to shine in our hearts. What begins as harmless and pro or protective grows into a barrier that blocks out his love and presence, leaving us isolated and distanced from him. Not only does pride separate us from God, but it also, also traps us in self-reliance, robbing us of the true freedom Christ offers. When we tear down the wall of pride through humility, the light of Christ floods in, restoring our relationship with God and freeing us to live fully in his grace. That's another example in scripture. Theologically, some people differ on this a little bit, so I'm not really going to go down the theological road, but it's a, it's an example um, in, in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, and I'm just going to read it. But it just shows you the pride behind our desires to be like God, to, to distance ourselves from God, to, to try to be like God, to, to try to be over people and conquer people and pro or lord over people. And we want to be in charge. We want to be the boss. We want to be the king. And it says this in Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol or Hades to the lowest depths of the pit. Now, here are the five, what we call the five I wills, and these are common. These are in my life. These are in most people's life, and we struggle with these, and we have to humble ourselves before God and others and, and get rid of these things. Uh, Lucifer said, I want to ascend into the heavens. I will, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation of the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. All of that is absolute pride, and then pride leads to rebellion. Pride says, I want to be all who I am, and I'm going to be the boss. I'm going to be in control. I don't need help from God. I don't need to submit to God. I want to be like the Most High. So when we exalt ourselves, we are ultimately brought low, descending into the depths of spiritual darkness and separation from God. Pride blinds us from our need for humility and dependence on God, preventing us from experiencing his grace and redemption. So I want to just go over some scriptures here. Again, these are just clear-cut scriptures about pride and, and how they affect us and just the meaning of them. And so I'm just going to read through a few of them here. I think it's quite obvious what pride is, but um, I just want to share some scriptures and I do want to say this, in the book that I wrote, Freedom to Live Like Jesus, each chapter has many scriptures that are written out, so you don't have to go back and forth with your Bible, although I obviously encourage you to have a Bible with you at all time, whether it's electronic or paper, it doesn't matter, but always go to, I, I, as a pastor for years and years and years, and just being a Christian for 37 years, I always try to have two or three different translations with me, just so I can get an idea uh, maybe what one is a little bit different than the other, but they all really say the same thing, but it's good to have uh, a couple different translations with you. Um, Proverbs 16, 18 says this, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. This verse emphasizes the consequences of pride that man, when I, when I'm prideful, eventually, if I don't humble myself and repent to God and humble myself before God, there's going to be a fall. How big that fall is, is totally dependent on the situation. And I don't obviously know your situation, 
But if we're haughty and we're prideful, there will be a fall. We will fall on our face and God will allow us to fall on our face so we could see the pride in our life. I'm here to help you to say before you fall, take a step back and repent and say, oh God, search me and try my heart. See if there's any wickedness in me. See if there's anything in me that's going to offend you or offend people, Lord, and help me not do that situation. That's humbling ourselves before the maker. Proverbs 11.2 says this, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Now, again, what is this talking about? Humility is us depending on the maker, on the creator and saying, God, man, I struggle with this and I, I always want to rush forward before I ask you and before I seek your help and seek your wisdom. I just want to run forward and do this thing and conquer this thing. And man, we just stumble sometimes and fall down and we get hurt. And then we get mad at God sometimes and we blame him for the situation that we ran into. And he would have said, don't run into it. And it's all about our pride. But these scriptures are saying something to us. Take a step back ask the Holy Spirit. This is what this book, Freedom to Live Like Jesus, does. It teaches you that you have full access to God. You can go to God 24-7 all the time and say, Lord, is there anything in my life you want to adjust or help me see that I could repent of? James 4-6 is a common one. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So if you ever want God's favor in your life, be the last. Let the driver that's trying to blink and, and or blinking and trying to get over slow down and let them in. Why you're you're not going to get to the next light or your next destination any slower. Uh, I had to learn that one over the years. I know road rage is a huge thing in our life, but what are we in a rush to do? do let's serve people. Let's help people. Let's if the person wants in, let's let them in. If you're on the line and and the other day, I, you know, I've done this a few times where I have a whole basket full of groceries and someone comes up behind me with, you know, two or three items. I just say, you know, get in front of me. What, what's the rush? You know, why are we always such in a rush? Why aren't we thinking the way Jesus thinks and, and help people and love people and serve people? Another one in First Peter 5, 5, it says this, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble, which is exactly what James says as well. Proverbs 29, 23, Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. Now, who exemplifies that more than anybody? Um, obviously, Jesus. Um, it says in Philippians chapter 2, and this is a paraphrase, that Jesus was such a servant, that he was such a person, obviously fully God and fully man, and we won't get into the theology of that right now, that when he went to a situation, it says that he thought of others more important than himself. That's the way we're supposed to think. That's scripture. That's New Testament. If we love God and love people, then every situation we go to, whether it's your spouse, your family, your coworkers, your, your shopping, you're on vacation, wherever you're at, we are supposed to say in our hearts, everybody around me is more important than I am. That is the heart of God. That is humbling ourselves before God and saying, Lord, I want to love you and love your people. Now let's move on to uh, rebellion and why rebellion is so dangerous. Rebellion against God stands, and, and again, let me back up here. Pride and rebellion go hand in hand. Um, I could have had them as different chapters, but they kind of go hand in hand. I wanted them to be together. I also put these toward the front of the book because I want you to see as you go through freedom to live like Jesus, you know, I, I the first two chapters were all about the power of salvation, how much God loves us, how much he forgives us of all our sin and all the wonderful things of salvation and relationship with God. And we're adopted and just the amazing thing about God and how we are supposed to lean on him. And I put rebellion and pride right after that, because what happens is, and this is just honesty, I brought people through classes like this for years and even decades in the people who just dive in and humble themselves and just say, Lord, I know I'm hurting. I know I'm breaking. Uh, I'm broken. I know I have issues in my life with all sorts of things I need to get healed of in my mind. Um, and they just humble themselves and they just see such great 
awakening, their transformation in their life. And just, it's so amazing to see God work in their life. And they're just falling on the rock of Jesus. The people who come into the classes that I've done and small groups that I've done for, like I said, almost 30 years now, and I'm getting better at it, but uh, still, still improvement and still a lot to learn and still uh, more love to give toward people. But the people who come in and say, yeah, I don't know about this. I don't know if I need this. And these a lot of times are leaders in churches. These are people who, you know, they're in ministry and they might be a pastor. They might be an elder. They might be a, a leader over the kids or a youth pastor, whoever. They're leaders in churches. A lot of times they just kind of say, well, you know, I've kind of done that stuff before and I don't know if I really need that. All of us every day need to humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, holy smokers, I need you more today than I needed you yesterday. And the more I mature in God, the closer there's, it's not, I'm just saying this as a, so we understand it. The more closer I get to God, which you don't really get any closer to God. You just understand his love more. You grasp his love more. You become more like him. The more we need him it, because Pride can creep in and say, well, man, I've been a pastor for 30 years. I've been a leader for 15 years. I've been an elder for 10 years or whatever. I don't know if I need it. We need it more. We need it more than we needed it 10 years ago. So to humble ourselves and be that kind of person is so important. So let me dive back into the rebellion part here. And I just got something to read that's really, uh, I think, really important. Rebellion against God stands as a defiant act against the very source of our existence and purpose. It is a rejection of his authority, wisdom, and love, choosing instead to pursue our own desires and agendas. The danger of rebellion lies not only in the defiance of divine order, but also in its consequences for our spiritual well-being and relationship with God. When we rebel against God, we place ourselves in opposition to his will, distancing ourselves from his presence and guidance. We forfeit the blessing and protection that come from aligning ourselves with his purpose, leaving us vulnerable to the destructive forces of sin and spiritual darkness. So God created us with this intention and purpose, as affirmed in, in Genesis, in the first chapter of Genesis, somewhere around verse 27, I'm paraphrasing again, but he declares that God created man. He created us in his image. If he did that, then he has a purpose for your life. He really, truly has a purpose for your life. Now, if you're not a Christian, I, I encourage you, call out to God and say, Lord, show me your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. Show me your passion to save me. Don't be afraid just to be honest before God and say, Lord, I need you show me where I'm wrong, this whole thing called salvation and all this. I know the word Christianity is not a good word in our culture because so many people call themselves Christians, but they're really just hypocrites, just like the Pharisees were in the Bible and the Gospels. So don't look at people and get mad at God. Just be honest before God and say, Lord, what is a salvation? I'm crying out to you. I'm, I'm, I'm voicing my heart to you, Lord save me. What does it mean? So God has an intention for you as a purpose for you. He actually has put things in you to improve this world. And I'm not being humanistic. I'm not saying that we save ourselves because we don't. We could only get saved through the grace and love of Jesus Christ by faith. It has nothing to do with us, um, good works or anything being saved. It's 100% all God. But he has an intention for your life. And if we don't admit that and humble ourselves, we're never going to see fully what God has for us. Now, there's a great example in the Old Testament, um, in the book of Samuel, and it was King Saul. It was the first king that, uh, first of all, the nation of Israel rebelled against God and pretty much said, hey, we, we're done having you as our king. We want an earthly king just like the other nations. And at that point, they were already doomed but basically at that point they pretty much told god to go fly a kite and the whole nation at that point just was in total rebellious to god rebellion and pride and we don't we want we want a king like the rest of the people on the earth and god designed it that he would be the king you'd be the he would be a, a heavenly king over an earthly people and that was the call of israel and clearly they failed um, there's another book i wrote on that 
called Does God Stand with Israel? It's right by this book on Amazon. I'm not going to go in there right now. But basically, the nation rebelled. And, and God even told the prophet Samuel, Samuel, don't be, don't be down because they don't um, rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And that's what they were doing. They were rejecting God. So God gave them an earthly king. And in the beginning, it looked like King Saul was going to be a good king. He was tall. He was big. He was buffed. He was good looking and all those kind of things that we look at success. And really, in his heart, he wasn't successful at all. So it's a quote in here from a, a guy that's been doing ministry for a long time. And I really appreciate his ministry. It really affected my life. Uh, Neil Anderson. I want to read you a, kind of a quote that he does out of and talks about King Saul. And it's something that we should all adhere to. That's really important. And his is, this is a paraphrase quote, but it's out of one of his books, Neil Anderson out of the restored book. Obviously I want to give him all the credit for this quote. But it says this, who holds the reins of your life? Do you believe it's you? Contrary to this belief, God never intended for our souls to function as masters. Now, the world system is going to completely differ with that and say, this is bunk. This is, this is a lie right here. This is actually the truth. This is how God designed it and how he made us that we would be ruled by him as the king of kings and as the master. So let me continue here. In any given moment, we are either serving God or serving our own desires. Despite the poetic notion of being the master of our own fate and the captain of our soul, such autonomy is a profound misunderstanding. When we live for ourselves, seeking our own interests, justifying our actions, and glorifying ourselves, we are, in fact, enslaved to worldly desires. Our own fleshly impulses and the devil's schemes. We deceive ourselves into thinking we're pursuing our own interests, when in reality we're trapped by forces leading us away from the genuine freedom and fulfillment. That's so important that we, the more rebellious we are, we think we're doing the right thing. When we're actually walking away from freedom, we're going to, we're beginning to be trapped more and more into a enslaved world system. I'm going to go on with the quote. Jesus taught that the way of the cross is one of self-denial, where we say no to our selfish desires and yes to God. This represents life's ultimate struggle, a battle between our will and God's. Believing we can be God or act as such in an ultimate, is an ultimate deception, echoing the lie from the Garden of Eden when Satan tempted humanity with the promise, you will become like God, attempting to observe God, observe God's place in our is our gravest mistake. Surrendering everything to God might appear to be a significant sacrifice, but what we are, what are we truly relinquishing? We're trading a lower, fleeting existence for a higher, eternal one. This exchange isn't a loss, but a profound gain. The prevalent ambition of fallen humanity is to often find happiness in worldly pursuits akin to animals seeking mere survival and pleasure. However, God calls us to a loftier purpose, to be blessed as his children. By denying ourselves and aligning with God's will, we embrace a life that transcends mere existence. So again, this quote is from Neil Anderson out of the book called Restored. He's written over a hundred books. I love his ministry and I love his theology behind getting set free, but he's right on the money. When we pursue rebellion against God, what we're doing, we're being trapped into a situation and is only going to end in a very bad situation, which we see in 1 Samuel 15 here, um, when King Saul did this at, toward the end of his life. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says this, for rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Now, what does that mean? When I rebel, I'm living in witchcraft. Why is witchcraft considered evil against God? And it is. It's evil because we're depending, we are seeking guidance, we're seeking direction, we're doing everything we can to enhance our life and get direction in our life from forces outside of the creator. 
In other words, God made us, God designed us, God has intention for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And then this is what we do. And I'm giving you just an example here. I'm going to go to this tree out here in the yard and I'm going to talk to the tree about direction because I think the tree has some power. What I'm actually doing, and, that, and that's not a bad example, it's an example of witchcraft. And whether you look at crystals, whether you look at horoscopes, whether you look at anything for divination direction outside of God, you're, you're in rebellion or witchcraft against God. And that's what is so evil about it. Here's an analogy. Rebellion is like tampering with a faulty compass, convincing yourself it will lead you in the right direction when in reality, it's pulling you further off course. Just as witchcraft seeks to control and manipulate spiritual forces apart from God, rebellion rejects his authority, attempting to follow your own path. Both involve turning away from God's guidance to seek power and control through self-will. That is why rebellion is like witchcraft. Witchcraft is saying, I'm going to seek guidance and direction apart from God. I'm, I, I don't like him. I'm, I hate God. I'm, he, I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. So I'm going to seek direction outside of that. And then spiritual forces get involved. The deeper you go into witchcraft, demonic forces. And then all of a sudden, they have you snared in this thing where you think that you're in control and you're completely out of control, you're being controlled by the evil one. In Romans 1, it says this, 121 and verses 21 through 23, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Therefore, God gave them over to sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Here, this verse is talking about rebellion leads to a distortion of truth and a worship of created things over the creator, resulting in moral decay and spiritual blindness. That's what rebellion or witchcraft is. I'm not going to depend on God and I'm going to go down my own road. The further I go down my own road, the more I get distorted. Now, in Romans 1.21 there, Paul, the Apostle Paul who wrote that, he's talking about the Jewish people. A lot of people think that he's talking about um, people that were just uh, um, Gentiles that were pagans. And he's not talking about them because uh, listen to this language. Although they knew God. Well, who knew God? OK, the Jews knew God in the Old Testament. Um, they didn't they neither glorify God as uh, him as God or gave him thanks to him for God gave them over to sinful desires. They exchanged the truth. Well, who knew the truth? The law of Moses, right? Who was given the truth? Moses to, to write the law of Moses and the, the old covenant. So this is talking about people who used to know God and that and even if they knew God, they still went down a road, uh, rebelled against God, just like King Saul did that we see the example of. And God gave them over to a reprobate mind or a, sim a sinful desire, sinful mind. And they just were completely distorted. And the only way back is to humble ourselves and repent and say, Jesus, you are the king. And I am not the master of my own fate. Matter of fact, if I think I am, I will go down to the grave and to destruction. Here's another verse in Isaiah 1, 1, 2 says this. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. Who's Isaiah talking about? He's talking about the nation of Israel again. God said, I raised children and brought them up. But what did they do in the end? They rebelled against my ways. And they said, I'm not going to do that. In Jeremiah 28, 16, it says this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year, you're going to die because you have preached rebellion against the Lord. Man, if you ever hear anybody talk about let's rebel against the Lord, I'm telling you, run from that person to someone out there that's preaching rebellion, that God is not the one and Jesus is not the Savior. Woo, baby, get away from that person. In Hebrews 3.15, it says this, as has been said, 
Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like it did in the rebellion. Again, that's a scripture talking about an incident back in the Old Testament when Israel hardened their hearts against God in the rebellion and God brought destruction in that moment of time. So how do we not harden our hearts? This is a difficult one. And again, I'll be the first to admit I have been very prideful in my life. I've been very rebellious in my life many times, even as a Christian. But every time I would press into God or lean on God or say, Lord, I ask you to come in and seek my heart, search my heart, see if there's any wicked way in me or see if there's any attitude that wants to reject your ways and do it on my own. I tell you just stories from my dad who now is deceased for years and years. I got a lot of rebellious attitude from him. He grew up in a very difficult situation. He was very grossly abused and neglected growing up and and you know he didn't really deal with it as a dad and, and ended up dying at 64 years old because he had so much stress on his heart um, and he just didn't deal with these things in his life. He didn't give them to the Lord. He just died in a lot of heart pain like a lot of people do and it's so sad. You do not have to go to heaven with pain. You can come before the Lord and say, Lord, I have been prideful. I want to do it my way. I reject the way people want to do it or I reject the way you want to do it. And when we do that, we get rebellious and it's the same as witchcraft. We're looking for direction. We're looking for answers outside of God who created us and God is so loving and compassionate, I'm just being honest with you, he will let you go down the road of rebellion and pride as long as you want until you fall on your face a hundred thousand times and you get up and finally say, Lord, I'm sorry. Search my heart and see if there's any rebellious or sinful way in me that I need to repent of. And God will always give you grace. When we humble ourselves, God gives us grace because he's such a loving God. He's such a perfect God, but he's also a God that will allow us to try and paddle a boat upstream in a very huge rapids, and we never get anywhere. We actually go backwards, and we finally fall and die in our rebellion. King Saul, the one I remember, uh, brought up just a few minutes ago, the story ended like this. God gave him a task as a king of Israel at the time. They went in, they destroyed this particular city that they were supposed to destroy in this battle. And God said, I want you to get rid of everything in there. Nothing comes out alive because it's just those people of just, they're nasty, they're sinners, they're pagans. And God was just going to destroy this particular city. Well, King Saul did this. He basically on his own, even though the prophet Samuel said, do this, he said this, save this person, save the king, save the best animal, save some things and bring them out to the war party. And what happened was this, Samuel came back down the mountain, the prophet Samuel, and he basically said, what in the world are you doing? You have rebelled against the God. You have rebelled against the king, King Jesus. King Jesus wasn't king at that time, but obviously Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have rebelled against God. Samuel took a sword. He slayed the king, and he told the people to get rid of all the, the animals that, that King Saul wanted to sacrifice. Now, why was that so rebellious in King Saul's heart? It was rebellious because of this. Ultimately, King Saul wanted to be recognized among the people. He wanted to do the battle, win the battle, but also bring out this, you know, the elite people, the king, and then the best animals. And he wanted to sacrifice them in front of all the people so the people can see him as this great and mighty king. When God said, no, that's not what I want. I want you to do all that within the walls of those cities and destroy everything. So that was rebellion. And this is a scary thing. It's the only place in the Bible that I know of. There might be another place that says this. The spirit of the Lord left Saul at that time. If we die in our rebellion and 
die in our pride. We do not want to be in that place because the spirit of the Lord will not be upon us. We will, we keep rebelling. We keep rejecting. We keep wanting to be like God. We, we keep wanting to be in charge instead of lowering our life, humbling our life and say, Lord, you are the maker of the universe. You are the ones, you know, part of the reason I have these backgrounds, um, it just makes it easy. But part of the reason is because when I go hiking or driving and I get to go on an adventure and I get to see, I love the mountains. I love lakes, just the beauty of it and just God's creation, whether it's out in the desert, whether it's up in the mountains, like the one behind me in the Selkirk mountains or the Canadian Rockies, where I was took some of these pictures as well. All you have to do is go out and look at creation at night when the moon's out and the stars are out and uh, whatever it is, whatever part of creation, you just go out and you just say, Lord, just show me your creation. Show me your beauty. And when you think of the galaxies and the, the universe and the beauty of our world, the beauty of the mountains, the lakes, the streams, the rivers, and you look at those things, you just have to humble yourself and say, Lord, you're so amazing. You're so big. You're so beyond who we are because you created us and we serve you. We want to be under you and we come under the Lordship of God. And that's where we find freedom for our soul. We don't find freedom for our soul. We don't find healthy mental stability or a sound mind for our minds when we're on our own, when we're on our own, trying to do it on our own is when we get in this trap of deceit and we continue to go down the road of destruction. Let's humble ourselves, come before the Lord, recognize him as the creator and submit ourselves to him. And we're going to get into the next episode on how to conquer pride and rebellion. But I kind of already led into it a little bit, but that kind of describes for us pride and rebellion. Pride and rebellious will bring us low and ultimately to destruction like it did King Saul. Humility and the recognition of God as the king, as the creator of the universe and the ones who created us and has a purpose for us, humility that recognizes those things, will be, we will be exalted in relationship with him and we will find freedom in that. This is Mountain Preacher signing off on this episode, chapter three, episode one in a book, freedom to live like Jesus, please go on Amazon, get the book. I cover so much more stuff in the book. It's like a study to go through along with a lot of scriptures from the Bible. Also, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I'm going to ask you, please, would you share this with a friend? Would you share the podcast? Would you maybe buy them a book if they can't afford it? They're only 20 bucks. You know, when you think of 20 bucks and getting set free from from pride and rebellion and, and anxiety and, and rejection and all the things that life hurts us. And there are so many people that are so broken out there that deal with so many different mental illnesses like, you know, depression and, and anxiety attacks and, and bipolar disorders and meditating, medicating themselves with alcohol and drugs and getting addictive. And man, our world is so broken, but the answer is Jesus. And that's why I wrote this book freedom to live like Jesus. Please share this podcast. Please share this book. Buy somebody a book. Go through the book with them methodically, slowly. Pray for each other. Encourage each other. Don't judge each other. Just help each other find the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Be blessed. Talk to you next episode. Mountain Preacher and Jesus signing off.